Hello everyone. Today we are going to paint this soft, loose floral composition. I'm also going to catch you up on a few things that have been happening as well as tell you another Alaska story. Welcome back everyone. If you're new here, my name is Teresa. I'm a surface pattern designer and watercolor artist. As you can see, I'm not in my studio today. In fact, I don't know if I will film in that studio again or not. So we have just become first time grandparents and we've decided to move to their city so that we can be closer to them. We've been looking for a house for quite a while now, finally found one. We closed on it a couple of weeks ago, but there are a few changes that we want to make before we move in as well as it's going to take us a while to move out of the old house. We've been there for 20 years, so we have a lot of purging to do. So I'm telling you this because I want you to know that I will be filming in, I don't know, various locations. I have limited equipment with me. I, I will be going back from time to time, but I really cannot promise you what my lighting or my sound or anything like that is going to be like. So I want to beg for your patience with me on those technical aspects. So I'm also going to tell you an Alaska story, like I said, so I'm excited about that. So get your paints ready and let's start painting. Okay, so I am going to use my favorite paper, the Baohong paper, and I will link it below for you. And I want to start with the center flower and I'm going to start with the stamen of that flower. I'm using the cadmium free yellow here just to give me a good reference point for this flower. And I've just used a very small filbert brush for that. And now I'm going to switch to my round brush, my black velvet silver. I'll again link all this below. And I want to use very clean water to start those first few petals. And I allowed my paintbrush to touch the yellow stamen so that it will start bleeding into these petals. And then I grabbed a little scarlet lake and I'm just placing that inside that watery petal that I laid down. So the whole secret here to getting this kind of look is to use lots and lots of water. So that's why I like putting the water down first and then touching a little paint to it. Now right here, I didn't do that. There's really two ways to do this. What I just did was paint just the paint, the pigment, and then I went back over it with nothing but water on my brush. So I am going to go back and forth between those two techniques throughout this whole painting. Sometimes I will put the pigment down first and sometimes I will put the water down first. And there's no real rhyme or reason why I do it different ways. I just kind of go with what I feel like doing. But the secret, the, the real tip here is once you have your water and pigment down for your first little layer, then add other colors. So as you see, I'm just dropping in that brighter pink, that quidoquidone red. Now I think this quidoquidone rose is really what I grabbed there, that real pink color that you see. And then I'm just kind of going back and fine tuning that a little bit. But the thing you want to remember is don't go back over with this new color and do a full sweep across those petals because that ruins that painterly look. So I've moved on to the second flower now and I put a little water down, but then I grabbed that yellow and I did not dab my brush on the paper towel first, and so the yellow came off very strong. And that's why I kind of cleaned my brush and wiped over it and kind of picked a little bit of that pigment up. 
because I didn't want it that strong. And I also allowed it to touch that first petal that we put down on the pinky flower. So those two colors will start bleeding into each other. And now with this leaf, I am allowing it to touch that wet pigment on the flower petals so that those colors will start to bleed into each other. And you really don't want to overwork this. Just let the watercolors do their thing. You touch the different colors together and allow them to do the work. And sometimes that's the hard part. You know, I have a tendency to, to fiddle with stuff and overwork them. So that's a word of caution I would like to give you is just allow the watercolors to do what they want to do. And now, you know, I'll lay down a little bit of water there and then I put that pigment on it and it wasn't blending out. So just take a little more water and go over the top of it just to give it a little more moisture to work. And these really do better when you touch different colors together. I think that's a lot of what I see people doing. They'll use just one color and then you don't get that merging of different colors and they can be kind of disappointed because it, it doesn't show off that real watery look when you only use one color. You know, it depends on how obvious you want that to be but in my opinion it just looks better with multiple colors and so another really good tip is to use different size elements so i'm putting in a few little flowers here that are much smaller than those larger blooms that just adds interest and texture to your whole composition and I am going to move around this, this composition, adding different colors and different textures. And a lot of ways that you can do that is through different types of leaves. So some leaves can be really small and some larger. And, you know, a lot of greenery has several really small leaves all attached to one stem. And that can add a lot of texture. So as we paint, I just want you to pay attention to when am I making strokes and when am I dropping in colors. Now the stems, I could have done them a little more loose, but I really like having some more defined lines in my soft watercolors because to me that contrast makes a much more interesting composition and it really helps to show off the areas where I've allowed it to be very loose and painterly. So I also will just stand back and look at a composition and continually ask myself do I want to add anything else and that process can go on for quite a while. In fact a lot of times I will take days to make that decision of whether I'm truly finished with a piece or not. So just fill in here any type of greenery or other flowers that you like to paint and just keep adding and keep adding until you feel like, okay, I have filled enough white space. You know, some white space is important but you can also have too much white space. So there's a balance. So as we work around this, I will add quite a few more leaves and things like that. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Alaska. I have a lot of stories that I cannot wait to tell you. Uh, some of my favorite ones involve a small dog that we had at the time and I really want to wait to tell you some of those because I want to show you a picture of this little dog. I mean, he is Mr. Congeniality and he was just the greatest dog. And I think we're really 
enhance the story if you can see a picture of this dog. So I'm going to hold off on that because I'm not at home and I can't get to that those pictures that I have of him. So when we first moved to Alaska, there was this real strange thing that kept happening that I could not figure out. I would wake up every morning and sit up on the side of my bed. And so the wall that I would be facing would be the wall that's parallel to the way the bed is sitting, you know, so I'd be sitting on the side of my bed and there was a painting I had hanging there. And every single morning, that painting would be just, just like an eighth of an inch crooked. And so I would straighten it, go about my business all day, get in bed that night, everything's fine. And I would wake up the next morning and again, that painting would be just slightly unlevel. And I, I really could not figure this out. So we had this little dog while we lived in Alaska and we had a dog door for him. And so he would just go out in the middle of the night whenever he needed to, and then come jump back in bed. And, you know, he, he's only 10 pounds, but he would still shake the bed a little bit when he was, you know, jumping up on the bed. And we had this little step stool for him so he could get up on the bed, um, you know, and just getting situated and, and it would make the bed move. Well, so in my sleep, because I'm a very light sleeper, I would feel the bed kind of jiggle a little bit. And I would always assume that it was the dog. Okay. And his name was Wally. So one night when the bed jiggled, I could feel him up against my back. And I, I realized that's not him. He's not making the bed move. And I woke up. We were having tremors. And that's what was, was making my painting get off, off balance. And the odd thing is, I didn't notice it on any of our other pictures that we had hanging. It was just that one for some reason that would really, you know, move more than the others. Once I realized it was happening because of tremors, then I started really looking around the house and yeah, actually a few things have kind of shifted a little bit, but they were not as noticeable for some reason as that one. So <laughs> that's when I really became aware of how many earthquakes Alaska has really continually. I mean, they have tremors all the time. In fact, Alaska is the number one state in the U.S. for um, earthquake activity. You know, and back in 1963, I think it was, there was a huge earthquake there. You know, they they have a big museum about this earthquake and everything there in Anchorage, and um, it was a very tragic event. You know, and California has tremors all the time, and I don't know why it never occurred to me that we were going to experience that in Alaska, but it didn't. And for some reason, they happened for us a lot during the night, but then I became more aware of things like that happening during the day. And the biggest one that I ever experienced was within the last 12 months that we lived there. And I was in our house. The dog was with me. My husband was gone. He was out of town. And I heard a train. And it caught my ear because there weren't any train tracks near us that I could think of. And I'd never heard a train before. At that point, we had lived there for three whole years and I'd never heard a train in my house. And very quickly, it became louder and you could just sense it coming toward you. And that's when it dawned on me and my dog started kind of 
running around in circles and I realized we're having an earthquake and in that moment when you realize you only have seconds really and you 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 panic and think where do I go you know because there is nowhere to go you, you cannot get away from an earthquake unless I guess you're if you if you're in an airplane if you're airborne but otherwise you can't outrun a, an earthquake um, and there's really no safe place I mean you know I don't want to get into all the what should you do in an earthquake situation because I really don't know and I, I don't want to make any statements about that but I can tell you what I did and I panicked and my dog and I kind of huddled together in the hallway um, I was taking a geology class at the time actually in Alaska which was a great place to do a class like that I learned so much about plate tectonics and all those sorts of things and um, you know I, I don't know I heard somebody say stand in a doorway one time so all I could think in that moment of a moment of panic was I grabbed my dog up and we just stood there in the bathroom doorway in the hallway um, probably not the thing to do but that's what we did and so as this, this train sound approached us it was like a ghost train that just came and passed us and it just kept rolling on past and you know everything shook for a moment uh, pretty much all of our pictures on the walls were crooked and I don't think I had anything fall off of any furniture or anything like that so it, it wasn't a huge earthquake but it was it was enough to scare me and I could not wait to leave Alaska after that earthquake because it just kind of shook me you know it terrified me really realizing there's nowhere to run and uh I still miss Alaska I would go back in a heartbeat I would move back but you know at the time that that was a really scary experience and it was very minor you know but just realizing the possibilities of what could have happened uh, that was even more scary than the volcano so while we were there Mount Readout erupted and that's pretty far away from Anchorage. I'm thinking it was about a hundred miles south of Anchorage, maybe southwest of Anchorage, but we still got fallout from it. It was like a snowfall. This was a long time ago. I'm trying to remember probably two, maybe three days of real ash fallout where the, the skies were dark and it was very very eerie and so there were several days where you really were not supposed to go outside you really didn't want to breathe this for sure it was uh, really not good for your cars so everyone was advised you know don't drive unless you absolutely have to you know definitely cover your cars you know if you don't have a garage ash is really just little rock particles that are really kind of like glass so they will scratch your car your paint your windshield they'll scratch anything if you just you know wipe your hand across it to to brush it off so you really kind of had to be careful in your cleanup so that you didn't just scratch everything and it, things were a mess for quite a while there's this one little spot on this highway that you could go and on a really clear day you could see it but even that was not nearly as scary to me as an earthquake you know the tremors that we we got so you know we we got to experience quite a bit during just the four years that we lived there you know i don't miss the earthquakes but I miss everything else about Alaska.
I don't know if you noticed it, but early on in the painting, I dropped a little bit of pigment right here. So I completely let it dry and now I'm just going to re-wet it and dab it up. I can't remember if this is a staining color or not. I don't have my tubes with me, so I couldn't look on it to see if it's a staining color. So we're just going to try and soak it up. And I'm going to use this neat little brush. You may have seen it in one of my other videos, but it has very short bristles, so it scrubs really well. And I'll link to this too. But I, I really like this for picking up pigment. So it looks like this could be a staining color. It's not wanting to completely lift, but I'm just going to keep working on it here. I think I can get it up enough so that it's not going to be obvious. Yeah, that, that's looking pretty good, really. I could have dabbed it up while it was still wet, but I don't think it really matters. If it's a staining color, it doesn't matter if it's wet or not. If it's staining, you're not going to be able to get it up. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but that was my dog. <laughs> Who's playing in the blanket. <laughs> he is such a puppy. And he's nine years old, but he acts like a puppy. So let's see, what else do we want to do to this painting? Oh, he is making a lot of noise. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm really testing out the colors here to see what colors I want to put in the center of these flowers. I want a little bit of yellow ochre in here. I had some of that cadmium free yellow and I'm going back over it now with a little more sepia just to darken those spots. And then what I would like to do now, I could leave it this way. That would be perfectly fine to leave it just like it is. But I really think adding a few details with some stronger pigment might really make this pop a little more. So I'm going to grab another size of this silver brush and just grab some more concentrated pigment. Just gonna kind of play around with it here and decide really what colors I want. I think I will use this cadmium free yellow just to add a few details to this top one. So it's the same color, but much less water. So it makes it appear a little darker. And I don't wanna overdo it. I'm just gonna put it just going to put a few basic lines and this flower down here has so many colors in it I may put several different colors of details so there's a little bit of the yellow I think I'll grab the Quidequidone Rose no that's Scarlet Lake yeah I think I'm gonna go with the Quidequidone Rose Just a little bit. No, I keep changing my mind. <laughs> it has all those colors in it, so you can't go wrong. But I, I did settle on the Scarlet Lake. And just put a few light details here. Just to help it pop. Maybe go back to the yellow. A little something out here. It's very easy to overdo this part too. It's all in what you like. So there's no wrong answer. No wrong way to do it. Just go with your gut. Now 
I think I might go back to the Quidequidone Rose for this upper one. The middle flower. Maybe... Maybe a little orange in with it. That's orange shade. And I'm going to water that down a little bit, but add a little Quidequidone Rose to it and let's make a a mixture there. Mm, that's kind of light. We'll go back over it. Still not happy with it. <laughs> yeah, let's just kind of smooth it out. We'll start over. Because I just don't like the way that's looking. So before it dries, we can add a little more water and just blend it in. To see how this works. Okay, yeah, I like that. Okay, that's just the straight Quidequidon Rose. Very concentrated. And one of the reasons why I really like these silver brush, is, you know, I have the whole set and again, I'll link that for you, but they come to such a fine point that you can do some detail work like this without changing to a detail brush. I have some really good detail brushes, but this is just more convenient. So I don't have to change brushes so much. Now, let's move on to some of the other little flowers. Maybe these little purple flowers. Let's add some more concentrated pigment to them to make them stand out a little more. I'm just going to water down a little bit of indigo here to add a little bit more detail. And really that's, that's all I'm going to do to finish this up. Let's just add a few details here and there. Just so we have some darks in here. And now I'm just going to continue working through some small details here and then we'll be done.
Well, I hope you enjoyed that one. If you have any questions, just pop them in the comments below and I'll get right back to you. I love hearing from you guys. So please drop any notes, comments that you would like. And I hope to see you again very soon. Thanks so much. See you next time.